this evening with all of you um, with the interest of the Junior Leader Program. Um, many, many moons ago, we used to have a curriculum like this called the um, Junior Leader Advisor Resource Guide. And this committee was tasked with what can we take from the old and um, expand on into the new. And so we are very excited this evening to launch to you as advisors, as the officer team of junior leaders to let you know what we have um, available. And then we also wanna ask you, what else do we want? What is our next steps as a committee? So we're going to show, share with you our best practices um, some resources that we have if you do serve in an advisor role. What does that look like? What do um, officers of junior leaders look like? Um, and then some programming that we can do called Adulting 101. And uh, I'm sorry, and also marketing as well. We, that, so that is what we're going to cover tonight. And um, I'm going to uh, pass the ball over to uh, MJ to start with our best practices. Hello, I'm MJ. I am a 4-H educator in LaPorte County. Um, and if Steve can pull up the handbook or promising practice book. <laughs> I'm just going to do a quick overview of what that is and what it looks like. Um, it was designed to give advisors, youth and educators just a basic structure of what the junior leader program should include. But again, this is by no means like something you have to follow. It's just to give you a basic guidelines of just some of the things that all junior leader programs should include at a minimum. Um, but you can also modify it or add to it based on your program needs as well. Um, so yeah, um, so all programming should include ways to fulfill the essential elements of 4-H. And if you kind of look at the table of contents, I'm not going to go through all of these sections. I'm just going to kind of, we're just going to scroll and I'm just going to hit the highlights of some of the things that they should include. Um, and then you can look at the nitty gritty de details later. <laughs> so yeah, see if you just want to keep scrolling. So this just gives an overview of the characteristics um, what we would like to see the junior leader program have, um, you know, being youth adult partnerships, youth led, it should have the guiding principles of positive youth development. Um, and then if we keep going, you'll see the essential elements of 4-H. That's all the hands on. Yeah, there it is. Hands. So we should have the um, essential elements of 4-H or activities that can fulfill this from happening. So activities that promote independence. Um, a sense of belonging for youth, generosity, or those service learning opportunities, um, as well as showing opportunities for mastery and the skills that they're learning in junior leaders. Um, then when we want to keep going down, we also give ideas on youth adult partnerships and how we want to try and get junior leaders to more youth led leadership, as well as um, the target of the development of youth life skills should always be kept in mind as well. Um, we give ideas on how adult advisors can help youth process their junior leader experiences using the hands-on learning process, the learn by doing part of 4-H. And that begins on page seven. And then there's just some guiding questions that you can ask after activities or an experience you've had or after meetings to kind of help debrief and um, get the youth to process what they've learned. Uh, and then if we keep going down, you'll see that we also provide tips for the structure of the program. So this includes roles of the advisors, um, ideas for officer roles and functions. I think that keep going. Yeah, there it is. Adult advisors. <laughs> it's a running marquee. It's a, like a movie in the movie. Um, then we also talk about ideas for communication with officers and members and the importance of officer development. It also lends some ideas on different officer roles. So if your group has decided that maybe song leader isn't relevant anymore, or um, you want to tweak recreation to be less of games, but games that focus on leadership and leadership development, you can create different um, officer roles. No one says you have to stick 
with the officer roles that have always been. Um, our county, they decided the kids wanted an inspirational or motivational quote person and just kind of leave the meeting with, okay, here's an inspirational quote to get you thinking about either leadership or your own growth and development. And so we made that an officer role. So by all means, don't think that just because we suggested these officer roles that your county has to stick with these. You can be as creative as you want. Um, so once we get through that, then we also uh, just, just discuss the importance of program activities. It gives it suggestions for program activities, such as the Adulting 101 lessons that we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, possible field trips ideas that can help junior leaders practice what they're learning, just ideas that can enhance that junior leader experience. And then lastly, it's just important that no matter how the junior leader program is structured, it should all have a focus on developing leadership skills as well as community service learning skills. And we do mention too, um, there's information about marketing junior leaders, kind of the difference between um, volunteerism, uh, community service and service learning, where to get ideas on that, and then how do you evaluate what the youth are learning um, in junior leaders. And that's pretty much there's a lot of information to unpack in this one document. So feel free to access it on the website. It is on there um, under advisor resources. <laughs> and now I will pass it to Pandora and Kathleen. Yeah, so right underneath where those promising practices is a 4-H mentor manual. And this guide has actually been something that when the subcommittee, um, I guess I should back up, um, there were many different subcommittees of this junior leader, um, uh, or of this junior leader committee that we all kind of took pieces. And Pandora, Woodward, and myself, um, and some other colleagues have worked on the adult advisors. And when we really looked at what does an adult advisor need, a lot of the same things as it just being a 4-H um, volunteer in general. So we actually created this document called the 4-H Mentor Manual for all 4-H volunteers. So it is all encompassing of um, some of our terminology of what is our vision and mission, mission of Indiana 4-H. So it's a one-stop shop um, document that not only can advisors as yourself for junior leaders could uh, be part of, but also if you're serving in other many, as many of our volunteers have many hats on, um, this is applicable to all volunteering. It goes through our philosophy of 4-H, the um, hands-on lear learning of experiential learning. There are pages there that have um, all the different ways that you can serve as a volunteer. So um, yeah, the inclusionary statement that 4-H is for all is there, that we're very adaptive and um, um, we have different delivery modes of how you reach our 4-Hers. There's not just a one, one way to do 4-H. And as we know with junior leaders, this is just a, a guide that we have that um, you guys, the beauty of junior leaders is that you can um, ever change the program. So this document that I'm just highlighting here kind of helps us give that baseline of what is 4-H and why do we do the way what we do. Um, the screen there is about our life skills. Many times we talk about it when we're getting ready for scholarships or well, what did that project help you build? Um, we, we, we focus on our life skills. It's, it's teaching those responsibilities, communication skills, and it all focuses around um, our 4-H pledge of head, heart, hands, health. So um, that's a great document to review yourself talked about the experiential learning model as well. There's places where you can write a little bit of notes as well as then um, I think towards the end, Steve, um, oh, the different ways that we learn. We learn all different ways of um, competitively, individually, or cooperatively and um, talk about our histories and who who are our people of N4H as well as the um, County Extension Educators, our um, 
our volunteers and um, our national partnerships that we have on, um, on a, a national level, that we are part of a greater network. Um, so that, that document is just there for us to, um, to help get, but that, this page right here, Youth Adult as a Partnerships, um, I know we, we have lots of youth on this page and we wanted to make sure that we, we did focus on, on what does it mean a true youth adult partnership. Um, as I tell my junior leaders in Hamilton County, I've already had my time in junior leaders and I want to make help support whatever their vision for their junior leader program is. So it's a true partnership between the adult advisors and our 4-Hers. Um, so how do we plan that? How do we how do we go through those steps? Um, that document. What is a club meeting? Because not a lot, not everybody knows. Um, you know, has been going to 4-H their third grade. Um, we want to catch them wherever they're at. And what does it mean to have a club meeting? That is just one model of many. So um, I'm gonna pass. I think that's it, Steve. On that. Let's pass the ball back to Pandora on all the other different advisory resources that we have created. Hi, everybody. My name is Pandora Woodward. I'm the 4-H educator in Boone County. And um, just like Kathleen uh, was sharing the promising practices in the mentor manual, excuse me, MJ and, and Kathleen there sharing, we're just wanting to provide you guys with lots of different resources. Um, to help you um, run your junior leader program. We know that there are 92 different um, ways of running junior leaders, but these are some guideposts um, that we'd like for all um, of the junior leader groups uh, to be using in, in the different counties. And, and so we wanna make sure that we're providing you all with, with great resources and um, up-to-date um, resources. So that's what, what all of these things are. Um, the next thing that I thought would be um, important to share with you guys is as advisors, what is your role? What is the expectation that um, Indiana 4-H or um, the extension educator has of a junior leader advisor or project leader? And so um, we've updated the role uh, role description, um, and you can find it here. Um, some counties, the extension educator may require you to sign this um, and turn it back in when you become an advisor for the first time. Um, other times they may just share it with you so that you can understand what the expectations are of you. So we go into um, what are the responsibilities of the volunteer? Um, and um, I don't think there'll be too many things that are um, surprising on there. Um, we want you to make sure that you are trained and so that you're, you're um, attending volunteer development sessions, kind of just like this one this evening, um, that you're following policies and procedures, um, that you're recruiting junior leader um, junior leaders. So they start off as general requirements that we would have of all 4-H volunteers, and then they go specifically into the responsibilities uh, that you would have as working with the junior leader program. Um, assisting managing the finances, that's um, a really key thing because there just isn't other they don't teach that at school anymore. And so junior leaders and 4-H in general is a great resource. Um, it certainly takes time. We all know that to um, work with youth and, and teach them these things properly, but um, what a great and safe environment we have in 4-H that we can teach these things. Uh, next, we talk about what are the qualifications that you have to have to be um, a 4-H uh, volunteer specifically with the junior leader organization. Um, and then we like to provide training and resources for you all um, so that you can succeed in your volunteer position. And so those things are provided there. A lot of times um, extension educators will meet with 4-H um, volunteers and say, hey, look at my bookshelf over here full of resources or I'll email you some electronic resources and stuff to help you. Um, if you're um, part of Area 6, we provide educational totes to like our club leaders. Um, so no matter what role you're in, um, there's always resources that an extension educator can provide to you. Um, and then we have the contact information for who you answer to at the extension office, most likely the 4-H youth educator, um, where you will be having meetings and what the expectation is there. Um, salary, uh, most of our volunteer positions are just that volunteer um, and unsalaried. Um, but we've added a last part here about what you'll gain as a 4-H volunteer. So maybe you're not being paid, but um, 
you can certainly gain uh, from being a 4-H volunteer um, and, and give back and, and learn all at the same time. So um, like I said, some of your counties will, will ask you to sign this and turn it in every year. Um, otherwise, um, some will just provide it to you when you're a 4-H volunteer. So, um, all right, Steve, can we go back now to the um, website? real quick. So, and I also want to point out that Kathleen shared the link to this website for you all. So it is on the Indiana 4-H uh, website. You go to projects and then you click junior leaders. Oh, thank you, Steve. He's going to go up here to the top here where you see projects and then he scrolls over to junior leaders. And that's where you can find all of these resources and some other, other things. But if you start to scroll down, um, then uh, it then all of these new resources, Adult Team 101, which we'll get to here in just a moment, um, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So um, thank you, Steve, for that um, guided tour. So now on to what is the role of our officers? And so um, many of you as advisors have maybe been using the general 4-H um, club officer position descriptions, which are very good. Um, and um, these that we have created are very similar, only they look specifically at the junior leader program. Um, and uh, Steve, will you open um, like the president one for me there? So um, on all of the role descriptions, they look very similar as far as what um, categories we have. So we talk about what are the qualifications to uh, run for this position? What skills do we like you to have? What are the responsibilities of that position? And what will you gain from this? And I, I really like that we've added this, um, what have you gained part, because as our junior leaders, as older 4-H members, um, they're starting to um, apply for scholarships, they're starting to apply for colleges. And if they're specifically applying for the Indiana 4-H Foundation Accomplishment Scholarships, um, those focus on what you've learned in 4-H. And so I think if we can give those kids the opportunity to point out, here's what skills you should be learning, hopefully they'll make that connection when it comes back to writing those scholarships. So um, you'll see that a lot of them have similar um, skills that they'll learn, but um, but then like for treasure and stuff, obviously accounting um, skills and things like that, they're going to learn. So um, all of these documents I wanna mention are editable so that if your junior leader program has another expectation for your president or your vice president or whatever, you can download this document and then add responsibilities and expectations or take away whatever you need to. So um, we just wanted to give you kind of that template to go with um, to help you get started. And like I said, gear it towards the junior leader organization. So um, along those same lines, so Steve, I'm gonna just, point out the different positions here. You don't have to click on any of them. Um, but uh, some ones that, you know, you typically know the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Service learning um, for many might be the term community service, um, but service learning is the term that we use in the National 4-H program. Um, technology and social media is one I think um, we can all agree um, is probably something we're needing more than ever now that we're going virtual. Um, these uh, 4-H youth um, are way smarter on technology than most of us. So let them use the skills that they naturally have um, and use that in a leadership role um, like that. So that's a great new position. I know we've added it in Boone County this year um, and I'm excited to see the youth run with that. Um, we all may have um, different looks of a food stand, but we've started um, a role position there. If that is an officer role or a junior committee or something like that, that's on there. Um, mini 4-H and um, board representatives. So that may be your council, your fair board, your ag association, your extension board. Um, what are those expectations of the junior leaders who sit on that board? And then lastly, there is a template there for you. Um, so you can click on that, Steve, for me, please. Um, the template is just, um, the basics for you. So if there is another officer position that you have, download that and then you can um, edit as you need to uh, for that one. So we, again, we're just trying to provide you with great resources to make your job as a volunteers and as officers um, easier here in the junior leader program. So thank you for that, Steve.
Um, the last thing that I'm going to point out this evening that I'm going to pass it on to Kelsey is um, the guest speaker ideas, um, which is, yep, thank you, Steve. Um, and here we have provided you a list of suggestions of guest speakers. We're always looking for new ideas um, every year, right? To how do we, um, what new things do we bring to our junior leader group? Um, and so this could be a great kickoff point um, for our youth to start brainstorming our officers what they wanna do. Um, so there, that list is provided for you as well. So um, that is all I have to share with you this evening. So I will pass it on to Kelsey, who is gonna talk about the very cool branding and marketing that uh, our committee has created. All right, Kelsey is actually not with us tonight. Um, but my name's Miranda and I'm the 4-H educator in White County. Um, so Steve, I'll just let you keep uh, sharing your screen. I think that'll be easiest. But um, I work with the branding committee. And so we've put together some really neat um, resources that um, you all as advisors can use. Um, you know, everyone's familiar with the junior leader name, um, but we want to kind of build that brand consistency across all 92 counties, even though each program looks a little bit different. Um, having a consistent brand is something that we're um, trying to do, and I think it's pretty important. Um, so Steve, if you want to click on the first one, how to use the junior leader brand. Um, so kind of the most important thing to recognize, so we have this really awesome logo up in the top corner there. You can see it's got nice colors. Um, junior leaders really stands out, but it's still obvious that it goes with Indiana 4-H. Um, so that logo is awesome but it can't be used by itself. So that's probably the most important thing to keep in mind when you guys are designing shirts and things like that. Um, make sure that, see if you could scroll down to the next page. Um, make sure that it is co-branded with the Purdue Extension logo as well. So um, you can see on those sh shirt examples, it's got the Junior Leaders logo and the Purdue Extension logo. Um, so both those logos are important. Um, and then kind of similar to, if you're familiar with using the 4-H logo, you know, don't stretch it, don't um, put things on top of each other, change the colors, anything like that. Um, we want to make sure that we're showing the same logo all the time, making sure that we're really being consistent with things. All right, Steve, you can go back for me. All right, so we've got some really cool other things. So the logo doesn't only come in color, it comes in black and white and white. So you can go ahead and click on any of those. There's our color one. Black, <laughs> can't really see that too well, but if you downloaded it, you would. Uh-oh, okay. uh did we lose our page? Give me a moment, we'll get it back, <laughs> not to worry. This will teach us all how to get to it again because yeah. once you get to the state page, you're going to want to go to projects and junior leaders and then you scroll all the way down and where do you want me to go um go ahead and do the template so a common theme and i apologize if you guys hear something screaming in the background i have a puppy and she's not very thrilled to be in her crate right now but um one of the things that we try to provide is you know flexibility we know that each program is different Hang on just one second. Um, we understand that each program is different. And so we want to really make it flexible for each different program. So this is a template you can use for different lessons. Um, so I know Anna's going to talk about the lessons that we've already created. But if you have an idea or your junior leaders come up with an idea that they want to use for a lesson at a meeting, um, they, you can go ahead and fill this in all on your own. So. Um, we also have really cool Zoom backgrounds, lots to choose from. We can never get enough of those Zoom backgrounds for sure. All right. Um, and we also have social media posts. So we've got 14 different ones to choose from. And then we also have captions to go with them. So really, it's not hard to put together social media posts, work with your extension educator. Um, you know, everything's right there, all the hashtags, you just kind of plug your um, website in there if you need to. Um, so it should be really straightforward, really easy to be able to use these branding um, options. Yeah, a couple examples there. 
And so these are actual junior leaders from across the state. So, you know, if you happen to click on one, you might see some of your own junior leaders in there. So lots of options as far as branding. Mm. Awesome. Um, Yes, and then the kind of at the bottom there, you can see it says notebook cover and spine. Um, so if you guys are, are big binder people, like to have a hands-on copy of things, um, we created a cover and then the spine for the notebook. Um, so that way you can print that off if you'd like to. So lots of options. I know I'm a person that likes to have a, an actual like physical notebook. So I will probably be printing this stuff off to use myself. So I think. That's pretty it. Ours is pretty short. Everything's right there for you guys to use. Um, it's all pretty straightforward. Um, and if you do have any questions on the first um, link, the how to use the brand, um, there's an email address for Jenny Clark and she's our um, kind of social media gal for 4-H. She's awesome. So if you do have any questions, reach out to her. She's really helpful um, with all that social media kind of stuff. So thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Anna Williams. I'm the Jasper County 4-H educator. Um, and if Steve, if you wouldn't mind going back to the PowerPoint, um, I've got some slides I wanna share with you because we're really excited. And we've worked really hard on developing a curriculum that you guys can take and you can use at your junior leader meetings right now, um, today, if you wanted to. Um, so it's called Adulting 101. And so why did why use this program or why use this curriculum? So we developed it based on direct feedback from our junior leader members. Um, we sent out a survey, it's been a few years back, um, but we sent out a survey to our current advisors and um, junior leader members on what they felt that they wanted out of their program. And this is a direct um, um, result of that survey. And so what it is, it provides lesson plans and resources specific to the junior leader youth program, specific to this age group and what they want. Um, so you're giving them what they want. You know, we said before, you need, we need to, you know, make our program what they want. And so here's something that we've been told. Not, not it's not gonna suit everybody, but at least part of your junior leader crew will love some of these um, resources. And of course, our youth gain skills that are needed to be successful adults. That's why we called it hashtag adulting. I don't know about you, but I've heard that hashtag float around social media. Um, whenever somebody might post something that, hey, I voted today, um, hashtag rock the vote, hashtag adulting. It's something that you, you simulate with, I'm an adult now. This is something I have to do as an adult. Sometimes we're not the most positive um, results or positive things that we get, our most fun things we get to do as adults, but they make us successful and they make us um, contributing members of the society. And so, so that's why we named it hashtag adulting. And that's why um, we think it's important for our youth to, to kind of get these soft skills or life skills um, right from that junior leader program. So if you want to go on to the next slide, Steve, um, we can kind of skip this. We've already shown you that website multiple times tonight. That's where you get this adulting curriculum. So let's bring up the lesson plan, that table of contents. So again, if you're a binder person and you want to have these covers and you can print these right off and you want to hand them out to your officer team to say, hey, guys, here's eight lesson plans that we can work out of. Um, you can go ahead and do that. So we created that um, cover sheet in the table of contents there. But some of the lessons that you're going to see right there, um, we have lesson one. It's called Wheels, Deals, and Automobiles. So we're going to kind of go a little bit more into depth on that one tonight, a little bit more examples. And that's all about buying a vehicle. Okay, sometimes it's not the most pleasant experience. Some people really love it. We're going to go into a little bit more depth there. Um, lesson two, kind of, it, it kind of piggybacks off of that one a little bit because we talk about credit and credit worthiness in the lesson one. Um, but it talks about why credit matters. Um, number three, of, co of course, rocking the vote. That might be very appropriate this year <laughs> and in future years, okay? So maybe talking about um, what is voting and voting registration and um, the, how to research your candidate's information. That's very apropos, I believe. Um, lesson four, tackling your laundry pile. 
Um, that's a, that's a, something, again, you have to know how to do your laundry unless you want to have shrunken sweaters for the rest of your life. Um, so number, lesson number five is your schemes, scams, and ploys. Um, so we want our 4-H members to be aware that sometimes there's not always honest people out in this world. And we need to be aware and be self-aware about things that people might try to do um, to take advantage of, of us. Um, and maybe you're getting a random phone call on your cell phone from a number you don't recognize um, from somebody that you don't know and how to deal with those issues. Uh, medicine 101 talks a little bit more about identifying what's in your medicine cabinet and what is an over-the-counter drug and how's that different from a prescription drug and, and what, did this, what does that mean when it's an antihistamine? What, what is that word? Um, so it kind of gives a little bit more of a background into medicine 101 so they can understand um, some of that um, material, that household material that they have. And number seven, understand your taxes. Yeah, that's a really exciting one for everybody, I'm sure. But hey, it is a fact of life, right? Um, so as May 15th is a major deadline in the forage world, April 15th is a major deadline in the whole United States. Um, so our teens are going to be expected to pay their taxes when they are adults, which in, in the US is 18, correct? Um, so they need to know that as soon as um, they're, you know, at the adult age. So again, that's adulting. And then lesson eight is more of a fun one, becoming the iron chef of your kitchen, teaching some of those basic kitchen skills. Um, so those are some of the eight lessons that we decided to come up with. Um, this list, you do not have to go lesson one, two, three, four in order. You can mix it up, whatever your, um, adult officer or your officers or your adult um, advisors want to kind of work together again that youth adult partnership working together to decide what's the best lessons for our club to do um, or you can do them right in a row it's up to you so go ahead and go on to the next slide Steve if you will okay so I actually wanted to show you an example and I might take over here Steve I'm going to share my screen if you don't mind I'm going to show you an example do, 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 do. Oh, not that one. Hold on. <laughs> I'm going to show you an example of um, the auto, uh, wheels, deals, and automobiles lesson plan. And I know we were just on this, but there it is. Okay. So this is, a, of course, we have our nice branding at the very top. That's our junior leaders, Indiana 4 H. And we want to make sure we have that. But each of these lesson plans are going to give you what supplies that you might need. Anna, what we're still we're still seeing Steve's. Oh, you are? Yeah. Okay. Then, there we go. Now we can see you. Oh, you can't? Okay. <laughs> Just a little bit of lag. Okay. So I'll, I'll know that for next time. A little bit of a lag. So, okay. So the very um, first box there you're going to see is the supplies needed. Just like we talked about or just like I just said. Um, the concepts or your learning objectives. So what are what do we want our kids to learn out of this? Um, and then it gives you a little introduction. You can say it verbatim. You can just, you can kind of riff off that if you want, but a general idea of what your introduction can be. Um, and then it's gonna take you into the activity. So the youth that are on this call, um, this is something that we've kind of um, worded out that you can take this and you can lead it um, with your adult advisor's um, assistance. So this is something that you can kind of grab and go. Adult, um, adults on this call, you as well. So I want to ask everybody a question, and I want you to put it in your chat box. Um, what was, if you're a, a, a teen right now, what is your dream car? And then as an adult, back when you were 16, what was your dream car? I will say my, my personal experience, I grew up in a very rural county. Um, I was very much a farm country girl and still am, but um, my dream vehicle was a Chevy Silverado 1500. <laughs> I don't know why I thought I needed that as a 16 year old, but that is something I was like, nope, that's what I'm gonna get. Have I driven one? Of course, um, but have I actually bought one myself now? No, <laughs> I haven't, but I wanna see, I wanna see what you guys, what, what was your dream car? What is, um, if you're a teen, what is your dream car right now? I kind of want to, I just am curious about what people like. Black Ford pickup truck, see, I'm not the only one. Okay, GMC Sierra Denali, muscle car, I was 69 Mustang Fastback, oh, nice. Corvettes, 
another Chevy Silverado. Okay, let's see what else was there. Jeep Cherokee, a Mustang, Wrangler, two door purple blazer, nice. Okay, old Bronco and a Jeep, Land Rover, cool, and a Jeep. That's awesome. And now if you think about why did you want that vehicle? Like what, what made you think that's the car for me? That's the one I want. <laughs> now, just if you could just think about what was it? Was it because it was cool looking? Did it have an awesome stereo system in it? Um, it's probably because it's more of a fun vehicle to drive is my guess. And that's great. Um, but sometimes we need to consider other things when we're purchasing a vehicle. Um, so another thing you can ask the youth is, have they ever considered buying a car? Because some youth might not feel that they need to buy a car at this point, um, or if they currently own a car. And, and what factors besides, um, or going, what, besides the price go into purchasing your car? So for me right now, as an adult, one factor is, I'm sorry, I have to have heated seats. <laughs> That sounds like such a spoiled thing to say, but I get so cold and today is not a good example of Indiana weather, but I get so cold in the winter. I love my heated seats. Anytime it dips really below 60, those things are on. And I love uh, my remote start. Again, I can't be, I just can't be cold. Um, so I, that's, I honestly, I look for that in my current vehicle. I was like, well, I need the heated seats. I need a remote start and there's other things too. But if they didn't have those two things, I realized pretty quick, I'm like, man, I'm not gonna get this car just because of that. And I know that sounds silly and, and I'm lucky enough to be able to have that as an option. Um, but there are different things to consider. Now, if we were car shopping with my father, which is, I usually bring him along and sometimes I regret it because he's very analytical, but his important things I can tell you right now, it's gonna be miles per gallon, how much mileage is how much mileage is on that car? Um, what's the maintenance going to be on it? Um, all of those practical, very practical thoughts that that's why I bring him along because he thinks of those things sometimes more than I do. When I get wrapped up in the shiny package, he kind of brings me back down to earth. And sometimes, sometimes you need that. Sometimes it's a buzzkill. Don't tell him I said that. But so there's other things that go into purchasing a car besides the price. So you want to have them try to identify what are those potential costs that they might have when owning a car. So obviously purchase price is the, the thing that you're going to think of the first, but you want to see what do they think is going to be some other costs that they might have. Okay. So we have a great video that I'm going to show. It's about seven minutes long. I'm not going to show you probably the whole, well, we might have time, but eh, I'll show you some of it. And it kind of goes into detail about what is the true cost of a car. Um, and then there is a handout as well. And the next slide will um, kind of show that once I show you this video. Um, but the next slide is gonna show you the handout that has the, the four questions, or actually, I'm sorry, there's three questions that you're gonna give this to the youth as you're showing the video so they can answer the questions as they follow along. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, which I'm already doing. And can you see my video? I know there's a lag. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and play this video. We're gonna watch a few minutes of it. And decisions to make when buying a car. Do you need a truck for the farm or a small car for the city? How important is gas mileage to you? What color do you want? Once you decide what car you want, figuring out what you can actually afford can seem a bit complicated. Your monthly car payments might be affordable, but you also have to keep in mind other costs you'll have, like insurance payments, registration fees, and unpredictable expenses, such as a sudden hike in gas prices or the need for a big repair. So before you begin to shop around for a car, you might want to take a look at some of these costs so you're not caught off guard. First, let's figure out your budget. On average, people spend about 14 to 16% of their annual income before taxes on their transportation budget that's a figure that includes all the expenses of owning a car, not just your car payments, but your gas, insurance, maintenance and repairs, and everything else as well. So for our example, let's use this as a guideline and look at what this might be for an annual income of $42,000. To figure out your budget, 
We'll take 16% of $42,000. That gives you $6,720 a year to spend on your car, or $560 a month. So let's look at the costs involved in getting a new basic subcompact sedan that has a sticker price of about $16,450. Now for any car, there are plenty of extra things you can get, like satellite radio or a sunroof, which can drive up the price. But we're going to forego the bells and whistles and stick to a basic model. And when you buy a new car, keep in mind that there are often extra fees in addition to what you pay for the car itself. You might have fees for things like documentation and destination charges for getting the vehicle from the manufacturer to the lot. Your registration fees may also be included, which can save you a trip to the DMV. Some of the fees you'll encounter, like registration, are non-negotiable because they are required by your state. But some things, like documentation fees and the base price of the car, may be flexible and open to some negotiating, depending on where you buy your car. So let's say that after negotiating the price of the car and the fees and adding on your local taxes, you're paying $16,750 total. And in this case, you're going to finance the car entirely. That means you're not going to make any down payment or trade in another car. If you get a six-year loan at a 3.5% interest rate, looking at an online calculator, your monthly payments will be around $260. But financing comes at a cost. In this case, you end up paying about $1,845 in interest on top of that $16,750 of principal over the course of your loan. So if you have the cash, you may consider buying the car outright. Or if you have a few thousand to spend on a down payment, you could lower your monthly payments and save an interest over time. But for this example, let's say you don't, and you've got a $260 car payment. Then there's gas. Let's say this car gets 32 miles to the gallon, and on average you drive about 1,250 miles per month. 1,250 miles divided by 32 miles per gallon gives us about 39 gallons of gas each month. If gas is around $4 per gallon, 39 times 4, we're looking at about $156 a month on gas. There's also your car insurance. Insurance prices are based on a number of factors, including where you live, your driving record, the type of car you're driving, even your job. If you're figuring this out for yourself, you might... Okay, so we went about halfway through on that video, and you can... I, I think this is a great video. Um, it really highlights the different costs that are involved, goes into a little bit of depth on each of them. And it's a little bit, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's effective and a good job. It does a good job of explaining um, a lot of the costs. So Steve, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can go back to the PowerPoint that you had if possible. Yeah, right there. Perfect. So, so as you as they're watching that video, um, you should be able to have them be filling out this handout 9.1. Um, this is side A of owning a car. So it asks them to list the different costs associated with buying a car that are identified. Um, so you know they can jot those down as they're watching. Um, and then again, which of these expenses expenses are generally paid when the car is purchased? So that's like a one time payment, right? Most most of the time. Um, and it's important to, for them to know and differentiate that in their mind, what's a one-time payment versus number three, which is what are considered periodic or ongoing expenses. So this isn't gonna be, oh, I filled the gas tank up once, I don't have to ever do it again, right? No, obviously we know that's not right. So they need to know what is actually gonna be more of their monthly expenses. Um, same with your insurance, you know, we're required to have that. Some are more annual payments, some are, um, you know, monthly payments that they're gonna incur, but, you know, Yes, that sticker shock, that sticker price, like, oh my gosh, my monthly payment is gonna be this. That's what they told me. That's what I figured out for my loan payment. But yet some people don't um, think about all the other extras that come to place. Like, okay, I'm gonna to have to get an oil change every three months or 3000 miles. Well, okay, well, oh shoot, you know, I gotta get my tires changed now. I've, I've driven the tires off, but the treads are gone. I have to do that. You know, things come up in, in a vehicle. Um, so you, they have to make sure that they're thinking about that when they actually truly purchase a vehicle and when they consider which vehicle to buy, right? Because <laughs> sometimes the fun vehicles, sometimes the great fun ones, they come with some more of those sticker prices and the, that costs. Um, and so if we know that sometimes, 
um, when we buy those vehicles. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and go to the next um, slide, Steve. So part B, so of that handout. So they're gonna kind of get an idea of what's it gonna be the cost of buying a car? What are all these things that are gonna go into it? Um, and then what they're going to do, um, and again, this, this lesson, um, it's, it's good if you have internet access where you're giving that lesson or if you're doing it virtually, obviously they're on the internet already, right? If you're doing it virtually, um, then they are going to be tasked with looking up a vehicle and then the expected cost and this will probably take a good 10, 15 minutes, I would say, to research what this, all these type of costs in the dollar amount. So they're gonna pick a vehicle that they wanna research. Or if you don't have internet access where you are giving this lesson, um, I would recommend um, the printing, and this is more work on your part on whoever is going to be the teacher, is giving them like four or five choices and the information that correlates with those choices. And then they can kind of pick from that sheet of what vehicle that they want to do. And then they can start um, and giving them some more examples. Um, but hopefully you have internet access because that really requires them to do the research for it um, and to really see, okay, what is my going to be my monthly payment? You know, what's that interest on that loan? What, so what's that monthly payment within my interest? What kind of fees are there? Um, so a lot of that might be on your bill of sale too, um, but then calculating that gas. And, and this is what the video kind of highlighted. It kind of went through that. But as adult advisors and um, as whoever is teaching this, um, you will probably need to be there to aid them in some of these calculations. Um, so we, think about that as you're, as you're um, teaching it and be prepared for that. Um, so these handouts, obviously, if you're doing a virtual um, lesson, they would need to have this beforehand. So you can direct them to the website to print it out. Um, if you want to go ahead and mail it to them, you can. So it will require a little bit of forethought that... Um, that if you're going to teach this lesson, like, oh, I'm going to teach it today. Well, they might not all have a chance to uh, print out this handout, right? Um, so you can, you can adjust as you need, but um, I would have some planning involved in when you're going to do these lesson plans. <laughs> if you want to go ahead and go on to the next screen, Steve. So that was one example of a lesson plan, the adulting one. Um, and so again, like I touched on, you can um, do these virtually. Some of them are better um, adapted virtually and some are not. If you wanna read through them um, and kind of think about which ones you might be able to offer virtually better. Um, and then we want your feedback and we want the youth's feedback that are actually doing these lessons. So we do have an online option and there is a link right there. And it's on, again, it's on that website, the original website. And the questions that we're going to ask is what's your county of participation? Um, which lesson are you responding to? Um, and then we want to know what's something that you gained? You know, what's one thing, at least one thing, you had to learn one thing from this lesson. Um, and then how are you going to use it? How, what, what's applicable? How are you going to apply it? Right. Um, and make sure we're, when we're, this can help aid you in your reflection part of your lesson. Because as you're going through the lesson, you should be asking reflection questions. Um, you know, you, like on the handout, you can be asking them, okay, what did you guys find out? Um, and so you can guide that conversation. Um, but this should correlate with that as far as um, how are you going to use that information? And then what future topics do you want us to help you cover? Um, or what would you like to learn about? So this is going to help us um, realize what impact um, of what life skills that they're gaining from these lessons and maybe um, even look at some of the behavior change that comes from these lessons. So maybe I wanted to buy a Chevy Silverado 1500 as a high school um, junior, senior, whatever. Um, but now, mm, maybe not. Okay, do I really need a, a truck when I was 16? I wasn't hauling anything. I wasn't, I was living on a farm, but my dad already had a truck. Do I really need another one? just to get to and from school and to practice and work? Probably not. Um, so that might have guided my change or guided my behavior change and what I look at when I um, purchase a vehicle. It also is gonna help us aid in revising any lesson plans that we need to um, and con to continue these too. So adding out different lesson plans that we need to, or um, maybe you have a resource that you found when you're researching these different topics and you're like, oh, this worked well in our meeting. We wanna hear about that too. We, we wanna be able to then provide it to other adults that are teaching or youth that are teaching as well. Like, oh, this is handy. Maybe you should include this in the lesson plans or as a, a, a handouts as well. 
So um, it's very important for us to get feedback on that. Um, you can do that through the link or you can print out um, these feedback questions as well. Um, so that's just a way for us to really kind of just like everybody, we all need feedback. Sometimes we don't like to hear it, but sometimes it's needed, right? So we need to hear that as well once you do do a lesson plan. Okay. I believe, Steve, that is all that I had on the adulting. And I believe I went over my time as per usual. <laughs> so I will leave it up to you for any kind of questions and, and to thank our guests for joining us. All right, thanks to all the presenters this evening. Really appreciate what you're able to share with us and really want to thank all of, the, all of you on the call tonight, whether you're a, a junior leader member yourself or you're an adult advisor as a volunteer or an educator working with advisors uh, or with the junior leaders as well. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. We are recording the program, so we'll post that on the same site where everything else is and feel free to take a look at that at some point in the future too. But at this point, if you have questions, we would love to be able to answer those. We've still got a few minutes left on the call if you would like to unmute or put them into the into the chat would be happy to try to address those for you and we would love to hear oh i wish they would have had a lesson on x um please share that in the chat as well um as anna said you know we started with a survey that we sent out statewide and and we asked um youth and and advisors and so we 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 know that there's many different subjects that people would like to see, but as we also know that when we were developing these lessons, we didn't realize we'd have to be in such a virtual world. So um, please, I, I appreciate the, the questions about um, how do we tweak lessons to go virtually. Um, please have those discussions with your um, extension educator. Uh, many of us are able to have um, Zoom accounts that have breakout sessions. So if um, junior leaders um, would like to have access to a, a Zoom meeting that could have that, that capacity, um, we're able to set those up from the office um, and past hosting powers um, around after that meeting is set up, um, as well as maybe um, mm -hmm. providing different um, resources that we have learned over these eight months here um, as well. Um, we had some um, sharing at the uh, Leadership Summit, which that's also posted on the Indiana 4-H website. Um, the Leadership Summit's resources are there that you can um, glean over th those resources that maybe we can bring those back to junior leaders as well. So there's some different topics there, but I'm gonna wait for some questions here. Karen, your question about how junior leaders could volunteer during a pandemic. Um, I think a lot of the times, um, at least here in Hamilton County, we've been doing things individually and then bringing them collectively together, like making Linus blankets at home or providing um, cards. Um, we're hearing a lot of requests for um, different nursing homes that would like to, they're accepting items that they'll hold them for a little bit and then they'll distribute it to, after safely 72 hours or whatever the local health department is, is saying, but then they'll distribute that to their um, their um, their members. Um, so we're maybe not be able to get into places, but there's things that we can do on our own and then collectively impact um, different places, um, care centers, things like that. Um, so I, I know of, of our um, county educators or our, our, our county junior leader members are working on that. Others have suggestions? I do. Um, so one of the really um, fun things that our junior leaders really enjoyed, um, well, you can do it now. I was gonna say when it's nicer out, but you can do it now, um, was they like to draw um, inspiring messages on sidewalks, like chalk. And so they did it around the health departments, the public spaces, the parks, as far as, you know, you know, it's a beautiful day, you know, and smile, enjoy it. Like positive caring messages. Um, they really enjoyed that. Um, again, the card thing. And um, there was a club, my junior leaders didn't do it, but there was a club of mine that did um, the raking of the leaves. Um, they went the, the rake dash. So those are still things that they can do. Like, in, again, like Kathleen was saying, kind of individually, but then you come together as a collective whole and make an impact.
So a question there, I'm, I've got an, an idea, then I'll let the rest of you come in with a virtual Christmas party. One of the things that we're doing for a group that I'm working with is um, putting together some care packages or Christmas packages that we can send to the students ahead of time, asking them to wait to open them. And inside there are gonna be some activities that we can do together. Also some uh, really good Christmas scavenger hunts that they can look for around their house uh, to go do a scavenger hunt, to go find a candy cane or a Christmas ornament or whatever, bring that back, show that on the screen, and that's kind of a fun way to get some engagement that way. Other thoughts? I was going to say along those same lines, uh, Steve, I saw where the College of Ag is having a virtual holiday party, and so wear an ugly Christmas sweater. Uh, they're having a contest for that um, as well, so um, I've seen that kind of uh, fun camaraderie uh, thing as well. Um, something that's not community service wide, but if you give a recipe um, to, to each of the kids or all the kids the same recipe and then they, they make that um, and bring that to the to this new meeting is something that I've seen done with adults and youth as well. So, um, and our junior leaders are doing the same thing as, as Kathleen said, um, as far as um, taking uh, something they've made to the nursing homes. And so as you think about Valentine's Day, um, now would be a good time to start planning something then, because again, our, our health department is telling us as well, you have to get it to us, I think at least a week or maybe two weeks before, um, and they're letting stuff sit before they give it to their residents. So um, something to keep in mind there. MJ posted that she, they tried a virtual lip sync um, a virtual lip you attempted how did it attempted it how did it turn out well we didn't end up having it because we didn't get people to participate but the idea their idea was that the judges would enter the zoom meeting ahead of time and then they would have their cameras off and like give them a code name or something so people didn't know who the judges were and then they planned that um i've create a Google form for people to enter, like what song we're supposed to be, you know, hearing. And then um, the youth that entered, the idea was that then they would like play the song and have to lip sync and their performance would be judged, you know, like on how well they lip synced and got into the character and things like that. So they had a really great idea and I wish that, that people would have participated. Um, but yeah, it was just, poor timing with the holiday and stuff so but feel free to steal it <laughs> yeah the ugly sweater kit i love it yes so we're doing this and then they can each show their ugly sweater and then pull on and it you know it's it's a a baking you have to make the cookies they're not in there so that's a learning experience good idea sarah I like that one good. You could also utilize the um, white uh, whiteboard feature and have um, like Pictionary, um, holiday Pictionary, or um, like those that were coming in. Um, Steve had an activity for us, like with some questions, and so you can roll a dice and and have holiday questions. What's like a favorite memory of a holiday? Their favorite food, um, just to get conversations. Um, you know, when we're in this kind of Brady Bunch um, looking experience it's um sometimes you do have to to call on you know if they're if they if you feel comfortable and sharing you know turn on your camera if you want to want to unmute um we have to encourage sometimes some youth um to participate um in those kind of things that's why sometimes chat or the whiteboard where they can add their comments while everybody's adding other comments or, or typing things um it gets the group participation You guys are creative, I'm impressed. Lots of really good ideas. And you can always take out the word Christmas and put in the word springtime or 4th of July or whatever. So these are activities that you can use not just at this time of year too. I like the emoji game. That's a fun one too. I've done that before also. Oh, that's a good idea. Old, using old cards to have them guess what song you thought of. Okay. There's an online dice roller that MJ found for us. We're in our, is our Area 10 4-H educators meeting tomorrow. We're doing a guess that holiday tune 
and I'm in charge of finding a couple songs to just play the first couple notes of, and people have to guess what the song is. So you could do that too. I think I would be very bad at that, <laughs> <laughs> but that still would be fun. Any other thoughts or questions for us this evening? Question, what is Purdue's policy on meeting in person? Is it strongly rejected, not encouraged? What's what's the dealio? So what you'll do, Janice, is work with your educator, work with the local health department and see what's doable given the governor's guidelines. And so it's we haven't prohibited or right, prohibited meeting right now. But at the same time, we need to be safe and smart. So uh, looking at the color that your county is currently in or might be in and when you're going to have your meeting and then trying to determine the best way to, to meet with that, given the social distancing guidelines, the face covering guidelines and those types of things as well. Um, would recommend if you are planning an in-person option that you also consider doing a virtual option for those that can't, who may be quarantined or maybe just don't feel comfortable being there so that they can also participate. Awesome, thank you. Sure. And with any in-person, um, we have to have a safety plan. Um, thank so you. So if you work with your um, county extension office to file um, and give us at least three weeks to um, have that process approved. So if you're thinking of a date already in January, please uh, reach out because um, knowing that um, campus, uh, we only have one more week and then campus closes. So um, it will take a little bit to um, get those through. Um, but not that we can't do in person, it just takes a couple steps. And um, But we definitely do want to think about um, having all all of those options, like Sue said, um, kind of a lot, lots of hybrid programming going on. And I don't know if you said this, Kathleen, but we don't have to have safety plans for every single event. If you're just having regular junior leader meetings with the same basic format, you can do one safety plan and include all those dates. Oh, correct. Yes, you could do it for, um, yes, for like the six month period or so. Yes. Okay, I think we are officially over our time. Thank you so much for the conversations and uh, love the, all the great new ideas. And uh, thank you for um, participating in our training this evening and you know how to reach us. Um, so look forward to seeing what great um, junior leader programs and um, come out of this new curriculum that we just launched. Have a great evening. Thanks. This was the yes. best Zoom, you guys. The thank best you. One well, thanks, Kim. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's our third time doing it, so whoop, whoop. <laughs> thank you. Everything was awesome. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. I had three.